episode 53 of the Roger Report podcast. It's snowing outside, it's not very nice, but we've made it into the studio. I'm joined by Gav today, as ever. How are you doing? Come over. Ah, you don't look not too well, like. like nah, I'm just, I've brought myself a little uh, cookie spice latte from McDonald's to try and sort myself out. It's very nice. Like. Very nice. James Nichols, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm quality, mate. Feeling good today. Good, and we're joined by a very special guest. It's Kevin Ball's son, Luke. How are you doing, mate? Not too bad yourself, matey. Not bad. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, appreciate thanks it. For me. Not very, uh, not very nice weather out. So appreciate the effort. Uh, so we managed a nil-nil draw against Wolves. Nobody gave us a chance. Uh, Gav, what did you make of the game? Uh, you can't not be pleased with that result. I just think, I think nobody expected us to go there and come away unscathed, especially with the squad of players we had available. Um, when I saw the team, I was pleased that Coleman had, had made necessary changes, which in my eyes were. Um, dropping Aidan McGeady for one yeah. um, bringing in some of the younger players like Lyndon Gooch because Lyndon Gooch I think has not really had a fair crack of the whip this season um, and I mean otherwise I just think I just think that really the team that went out set out to work hard and, and have a you know have a real go at it because I don't think we went there to win the game but I don't think we should have I think if we'd set up to try and beat a team as good as Wolves we would have got tortured um, so I can't fault it I think Coleman got his tactic spot on the one sour note was um, was Lee Catamore sending off but you know that that, that that stupidity is just I think it's typified his season so far I think he's really struggled um, and it, it's kind of culminated in, in you know although some of the some people may have a point when they say that Catamore was unlucky um, unlucky to, to even receive the cards that he did the fact of the matter was he got booked and then he, he a minute later got another yellow card and um, it's within the time know. frame for me I think I think that's mm. yes, yeah. yeah. I mean if it had been if there'd been half an hour between them then you would have maybe went mm, right I mean he's been a bit daft he was already on the yellow card he's got to stop putting himself in, in those sort of positions for me like he's how old is he now 29. 29. He's played 11 years as a professional. He's a, he should be wiser than that, you know. If a young kid had done that, you could maybe excuse it, but not somebody who's, particularly with his disciplinary record over the years, someone who's got his experience. I think um, I think he's just been very silly. And, uh, you know, luckily it didn't cost us. If, if anything, it actually refocused the group that were on the pitch and, and it actually benefited us in a way because Wolves then um, stepped it up a little bit more, tried to come at us, and we just sat really deep and worked hard off the ball, which, you know, I fully expected us to do and really happy with the point. It did feel like a... It, it felt like a win. Yeah. Because coming away from that game, I never... Well, I never expected us to keep a clean sheet, never mind get a point. Um, and it's a good building block. I mean, next week's next week's a bigger game for us. We've got Fulham, who are going to... You know they're not they're not doing particularly well themselves. So you know it's a good building block, and I'm I'm glad we got the result we did because it gives gives us a lot of confidence going next week. Luke, what did you make of it? I'm quite happy to see that we're intelligent enough to be resolute because how often of the years have we gone in these games and not ground out a result? Yeah. Um, to go there, I, th- I think we've been called anti-football. I mean, as a club, as a fan base, we've been called a lot worse over the years, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I'm happy to go to a high-flying team and take away not not conceding yes we didn't particularly probe deep we didn't really look like we were going to do much ourselves but we didn't concede and if you can go to a high flying club like that away from home and not concede that's not a bad building block for Chris I'd, I'd like to address this kind of stupid anti-football debate because I've had a conversation with your dad about it actually and it, it irks him when um, when people come up to him and say oh yeah you were, you were a great player but you weren't the best footballer being a, being a footballer you encompasses tackling, defending, exactly. you know, team yeah. spirit, being rigid. So to be the best football inside, you've got to be good at all these things. Well, if, and it's sour grapes by Wolves, I think. It really is. Yeah. If and, we, and they've if, got short, short short memories. Memories. They've got short memories. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, you, what were they expecting us to do? Go there and try and play against them? We haven't got the players to do that. You know. Put this way, at the end of this season, I'd rather grind out these results and say, oh, well, at least we went there and tried playing good football. We've mm. got done five every yeah. week. You don't get awards for good football. You don't, at the end of this You season. don't get points for it. Big don't. thing about Wolves like that is what it, it first came from Santo, who said it, Nuno Spirito Santo, the manager. And for him, post game, it's taken the, light, the highlight off the poor performance of Wolves. Like, point, they're a team who have played, who have scored on average two goals a game this season. We can see two goals a game this season on average, and they couldn't score. And that's partly because of how well we played defensively. But if you look at their team, they should be better. They should be scoring against us like that. And they didn't play too well. They weren't really. They were frustrated. They didn't have too many big, uh, big chances. So if Santo will come out and say that he's taking the limelight away from his players who struggled a little bit. Yeah, he's deflecting, isn't he? I think he's, yeah. in in a way he's doing what a manager probably should do, and he's deflecting a little bit away from his players, which I can yeah. respect. It's no different to what a, a Marino does. But uh, I think I think we were judged a little bit harshly, shall I say? I mean, there's, we're going to play a lot worse in games and do all right to put it that yeah. way. Mm, I, I think for me, my general thoughts on the game. What's pleasing is kind of Coleman's tactical system. He, he put 
like the five at the back end and it's kind of a, a reaffirmation of his preferred playing style and Definitely. we're going to get results that way um, it's the way he wants to play and it, it's good that he can implement that and it's going to work Gav what, what did you make of the, of the tactics um, spot on like I say you, you know he, he went there to, to get a point um, I was I was suspicious that he might go that way before the game he did um, I, th- I think that eventually we will play that system more often than not with Coleman mm. um, the box midfield is something which I which I like I think it takes takes the pressure off players like Darren Gibson who haven't got the legs um, press high it, you know if you can get a player like Lyndon Gooch in front of Gibson doing his press and form it, it takes well, that's a lot the reason you play him don't you because he's got the legs to, yeah. to go beyond I yeah. think I think we mentioned it before before the game I don't mind seeing a midfielder who can sit and hold but I do like to see one who can go beyond because there will be times where we need to go beyond mm. and, and that third man run might pinch us a goal or, or take the pressure off us a little bit and that's where I think Lyndon this is a big season for Lyndon because he's come on the scene quite well then he dipped out with his injury if he can pull his finger out, he might he might be quite useful to us towards the end of this, this season. He's had a, a good few um, international performances as well. He has. against Portugal stood out has been uh, has been quite impressive yeah. for the USA. He's he's a good young player who I think if you're looking at the backgrounds of of um, players and what they bring to the table at Sunderland, I think Lyndon Gooch, you know, he, he has a kid who moved when he was very young to the northeast of England just to follow his dream. Mm-hmm. And and playing for Sunderland at this moment in time is the biggest thing that he could ever do. Yeah. So. When I'm talking about players who don't want to play for Sunderland um, and aren't given enough effort, I, I couldn't level out of Lyndon Gooch. And he, you can tell he's dying to make an impression, which is maybe to his detriment at times on the pitch. You know, he does run himself into the ground when you could maybe do with his quality on the ball. But I just think at the minute he's 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 got something which we lack, which is you know youthful exuberance. He's, he's got you know energy and he and above all, he's got passion for Sunderland, which is sorely lacking in a lot of his teammates mm-hmm. and I think I think if Coleman's going to stand half a chance of keeping us up um, he has to make more use and he is because since day one he's, he's actually used the kids whether he would like to or not mainly down injuries but I think I think he has to make sure that Lyndon Gooch is, is being utilised mm-hmm. you know? and I think Chris is probably the type of man manager who will get uh, Lyndon going you know, you'll yeah, tell him to be definitely. when to be when to be tactically aware when when he can go on. And I think this is where Chris is going to come into his come into his own next month or so, maybe six weeks. He's a very good man manager. I think we've seen that with Wales. And I think mm. this is where people like Lyndon, I'd even go as far as James Vaughan. He's come under a bit of stick. You can get them on side by just pulling them aside. This is what I want you to do. You do your job. And all of a sudden, you've now got four, five, six players who are playing for their manager. To the, to the utmost of their ability and the results are going to start changing I think that's where some of Chris's strengths are going to come and you, we're going to see some results from it soon I mean the comparison I always use um, with Coleman's man management is the kind of Vaughan with a Hal Robson Carney or Sam mm-hmm. Vokes obviously Sam Vokes is a bit better at playing in the Premier League but he managed to, to get Hal Robson Carney playing well for Wales in the Euros so I mean hopefully he can do the same with James Vaughan um, I've got a question from Twitter from a, a user called Fergie um, how did Elliot Embleton do in the five minutes he got on um, and do you think he'll start with Catamull being sent off? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I think Elliot Embleton's a special talent. Um, he's in England under 19s international for a reason. The issue Sunderland have had for a long time with progressing the, the, the more um, talented kids they've got is that they're not developed properly, they're not given the chance mm-hmm. to go out on loan. Um, when they do need to be playing first team football, they're maybe not introduced you know, enough. Um, I think Embleton's still very young and very raw. Um, you know, he's, in January I would prefer to see him maybe go out on loan somewhere. Um, but immediately, obviously, we need we need numbers in the squad, so he's he's going to make up the bench at least. Um, but he's a at the five minutes he was on the pitch, I, you know, he didn't do a lot wrong. I mean, we spent that five minutes sitting back, really trying to mm. keep Wolves away from the edge of the box. It shows, it shows a bit of trust in Coleman though to bring him on with with five minutes to go. You, it that, does. That, that it, vital I point mean, we needed that. to ask an 18, 19, 20 year old to come on in five minutes and make <clears throat> any great deal of impact is, is, a, is a big ask. Come in and do your job yeah. and be tactically aware is yeah. probably what Chris is asking him to do and, if, and obviously Chris trusts trust him to do so. Mm. I think as I think you just mentioned before, that there hasn't really been an environment where it's been conducive enough for an 18 or a 19 year old to be playing. Mm-hmm. We're in a position now where they have to, or they might have to be in and around the squad. So it's it's actually quite a positive time for some of the youth team players because we can't afford to go and buy a three or four million, five million pound midfielder. Mm. Maybe you're going to get your chance or show what you can do in training at least. Our position right now actually allows us to do that. Mm-hmm. Like in the past, we've been in relegation battles just like we are now, but we had players who were on high contracts earning a lot of money who were bought for a lot of money. So it kind of necess- necess- necessitated that we had to play them. Whereas now we don't really have a big squad. We don't really have a huge list of stars anymore. We've got some big senior players, but these youngsters are coming through. 
And Embleton was one of the one of the players involved at the Toulon tournament in summer who won that. Mm. The England England team won that tournament and he played very well for them. And Embleton needs minutes as well, and it's just yeah. a big like it's it's a huge push for his morale to be included in the team so early mm. in his I hope, development. I hope he gets them either way because I think the one consensus with youth players is that they have to play at some level. Mm-hmm. So it's it's no good for him being on our bench. He needs to play when he's with us or he needs to go out alone. Another midfielder I'd like to talk about, Darren Gibson. He's He's been lauded as improved. I can't stand him personally. I don't know how, how um, you guys feel. I've I'm known, really not a fan of Darren I've known Gibson. Darren since about 14. Originally, Darren was at Sunderland. He, we, was he? Yeah. He got messed around a little bit as a kid and he mm-hmm. signed for Man United because of it. Mm-hmm. He was he was not sudden. He come over from Ireland when we were twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and he was no idea. So there you go. Yeah, but he's he's already he's all, all, always quite decent on the ball. But he needs to do more of it, mind, doesn't he? I mean, yeah, he's not yeah, gonna definitely. he's he's not gonna be your, your third man runner. But his his qualities should be good enough. His pedigree is good enough mm-hmm. for, the, the, for the certain. Games, the games where he stood out for me are the ones where the opposition have sat off us. Like the, when he came on against Burton, he changed the game for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I. I was one of the only ones really saying it, but I thought he was man of the match, mm-hmm. mainly because when he came on, he got his foot on the ball, Burton didn't press him at all, which dictate. is the worst thing he can do with him because he can dictate from there and he can mm-hmm. play the passes that he needs to. Um, he's obviously not got the legs to get about. He's not going to, you know, when, when we're trying to, to sit deep like we were against Wolves, he's not going to charge around and make tackles. He'll try, I guess, but he's not got the legs to do it. He's not that type of player. He's not athletic. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if you can find a role for him, especially when we're playing a five, um, where you can surround them by more energetic players yeah. uh-huh, that's... it works and it worked down at Villa as well uh, to an extent I know, I know we got beat at, at Villa but we played that midfield three with Gucci and Honeyman just in front of Gibson where he was able to just sit in front of in, the, in front of defence and, and pass the ball mm. um, there's a role there for him in that system you know I mean a, a question I'll, I'll throw to you Luke, uh, Luke sorry um, is because of his, kind of his lack of mobility and his lack of pace is his forward play and his vision is it that good to Accommodate him, that he must be accommodated in that team. Not what he's shown me so far, but I think he's, I think there is potential there. Right. But I think it's going to be a case of where Chris is probably similar to how Lee's going towards in his career. There's going to be games where he's going to be of use, and there's games where he's not going to be of use. And how far Chris judges that in advance is how well we're playing. Mm-hmm. There's going to be times where you know we need on a Darren Gibson to ping the balls in behind or to dictate the play. There's going to be times where we need a Lee Catamol to, to be Lee Catamol. Mm-hmm. You're never going to be able to play the pair of them. I don't think. I think it's going to be one or the other. Yeah. Um, and I think, as we mentioned just before, you're going to have to have a Linden or a George with him because just for the legs alone. Or even a Paddy McNair, someone like yeah, that. Yeah, when he comes back. Uh-huh. It would be interesting to see really what happens in January because we know that our best midfield probably contains McNair and Dong, but whether and Dong's here in January is another thing, isn't it? Um, see, I've, I've been a little bit disappointed with Didier. I, I watched him the first game of the season. I thought this is going to be you all over the season. And I thought you could do so much more. I think I mentioned at the time on yeah. Twitter, I thought you could do a little bit more for me. When he, when he went off against Borough, I think we went dead. We, we were flat. Mm. He was the only person in that game who was going to change. Playing like wider though. Uh-huh. Last season, co- when he first came, he'd done that and he was all right there. This well. is a conversation me and, me and Big Kev have all the time. For me, he can play higher. He's got the legs to it. He's got the, the pace, the energy, the the physique to, to play higher. He doesn't need to play in front of our back four, which I think he's been, been a bit guilty of in the last was it, season or so. Why doesn't he go and press on? Leave a Darren Gibbs or a Catamol to, to protect and you go press on because he, at the end of his, at his age, he should be wanting to be higher at the pitch. Uh, he's very energetic as well. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe in when we've got that five-man defence, when, when you need a midfield box-to-box runner, maybe that's his role, I don't know. It'd be interesting, like I say, though, by the time he's back fit... Whether he's still here, and you know, if 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 he's if he's still going to be here by the end of January, then undoubtedly he plays when he's fit, and it's. And I think it's going to be very important for us to be as well. Yeah, I think it will be, but because we don't have a lot of energy in the side, really. I yeah. just don't know whether we'll be here. I don't know whether we can afford for him to be here. Mm. I think it's going to get to the point where we, he might have to go for Chris to bring in a two or three people who we trust, who we can put his own hat on. We said on the pod, uh, this on the pod last week, didn't we? Probably Endong Kone. He's going to he's going to need to manoeuvre. He's going to need to bring his yeah. own faces in, and Endong might be a, an unfortunate I sacrifice. Because think... I do like the lad, and, and I think I do as well. To be what, honest one of you. the things that's good about him, regardless of performance, he's never really shied away. He always he, wants to get on the ball. He, he does. Even during the dark days of last season, he always wanted the ball, and he, he's and always it's not many of our players. You can say that too. And the point is, the more times you get the ball the more mistakes you're going to make and we, we have this level that Jordan Henson forever on his day mm. the more times you touch the ball the more mistakes you're going to make and unfortunately yeah. when we're towards the bottom end of the league table oh DJ makes this mistake I'm sorry but he's the only one who wants to get on the ball mm. he doesn't go hiding does he? no he doesn't I mean I, I don't know whether you can remember the Middlesbrough game I'm watching John O'Shea come out come out the ball with the back 
and he's passing it to, to uh, Aaron's left side and I'm thinking yes you look good because you're keeping the ball John but you're doing Aaron um, Matthews no, no fa- sorry Adam Matthews no favours there mm. you're, you're selling him short do, do you know what I mean so it's yeah. alright keeping the ball but are you keeping the ball in a positive in a positive fashion and sometimes DJ he can force it but I'd rather he you know was trying to be positive with it than given passes where this is a pass for pass sake to be honest with you you know yeah. anyone could do that me and you can sit on a bench and do that what do we make of uh, Donald Love's performance coming in um, I thought he struggled a little bit if I'm honest mm. but you know he, I don't think he's ever looked competent really at first team level I think I think there's one lad we've, we've maybe sold ourselves short on really and bringing him in I just don't really think he's uh, he's, he's good enough I don't know but to be honest with you what I've seen of Love I think he's actually a better centre midfield player mm. than he is a right back he, I've seen him play quite a few times at the under 23s level and he, he goes one for the ball he plays, you know, plays it forward. He's got quite a lot of energy. Right back, he just he doesn't have the positional awareness. He gets beat quite often. I thought there was a couple of times in the first half, in particular yesterday, um, where Wolves got down his side and the ball went flashed across the box and they wasted their chances. There was one I think from Jota which nearly hit the corner flag. But I mean, if he'd given that chance another ten times, he might put it away nearly every time, you know. And that 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 came from Love just not getting tight enough. Um, but they really targeted that right hand side of the defence they, they tried to catch O'Shea as well um, trying to go down his left hand side with a pace just to try and get him behind to be honest I thought O'Shea played alright I think I think Love um, he benefits from having that extra central defender alongside him but he's I just wonder if he's even really a right back if I'm honest Yeah. one thing you see with the players come through the Man United Academy like Love did is that they're always very polished they're always players who are just like kind of the whole package. They've always mm. there's not not really that raw. They're always like well trained and well developed quite well, even though it's only early early age. And with Love, it's, he, he doesn't seem like that sort of player. He needs a lot of time on the ball mm. to be successful. Like in the other twenty three games, he is a good centre midfielder and he he kind of dictates a lot of the pace of the game in those matches. But he is given and granted a lot of time on the ball, and in the championship especially, you you can't really afford as much like that because of the the way nature of the pace of the game in the championship I don't think I don't think he'd be playing there <coughs> once Oviedo's fit Matthews moves back over to the right doesn't he so yeah. he reminds me but you know when we had Mark Lynch a couple of years ago yeah. he reminds me a little bit of that you know he comes to me and you think oh there's a bit of a pedigree there Yeah, and it, and it just doesn't happen from here and I think it's. I think he's. He, sh- he should probably be one of the ones who try and loan out in January. If I'm he needs to go for, for a game for himself yeah. why would you want to be playing the under 23s you come from Man United mm. You've been playing in and out, son. You're not getting a game for Sunderland. Why aren't you then asking the question? Look, can I not go on loan? Because he's obviously he's not going to be a first starter here. Yeah. So why aren't you saying, listen, can I not go on on loan for a couple of months? Keep, keep my eye in. Because mm-hmm. under twenty three football's great. You know, it's it's all fine and well, but it's not. He's he's paid to be a professional footballer. Mm. You know, he, he should be want to be playing in the big in the bigger game. Shall yeah. I say? We wonder when we signed him. What part of the deal was with the McNair and Love double signing? Because Love only had one year con- uh, one year earnings contract at Man United by the time he left. And it was clear that he's never going to like make it into the Manchester United first team. So maybe I, I don't know any have any insight into this particularly, but maybe there was something in the clause of trying to sign McNair that if wanted McNair, how about bring love with him? Just so Manchester United could make some money off him out of this player that they've developed for ten years, ten fifteen years, and not let him go on a free. And they've only they've got like a very small fee for him, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, right, I look good on the books, won't it? Yeah. Right, we'll move on to Lee Catamull, the much maligned Lee Catamull. He's uh, he's come in for a real hammering. Uh, me and Luke were talking about this before uh, before the show started. What are, what are we saying? What are we making? I personally think that it's, it's just he's just ridiculous at the moment. Yeah. I, I don't really get what he's bringing. Yeah, same. Like the challenge itself, it's the nature of the challenge. It's the problem for me. The first one is a little bit contentious. It's like maybe it might be a yellow card, maybe it's not. But it's his reputation that's brought that yellow card out. And he's got that reputation because of exactly what he'd done within 90 seconds later. Mm. He's lost the ball and impetuously just jumped in and challenged like that to gain it back again. And it's, and it's just utter stupidity. He can't be doing that on a yellow card 90 seconds after the other one. Like if it's half an hour, 45 minutes apart, it's a little bit more excusable because he's, and then it is obviously a very contentious yellow card, but you, you just can't do that in the way that he has. And that just typifies his career, to be honest. You can say he's been, he's been hard done by, by a couple of the decisions maybe, but you, you can't put yourself in that position. Yeah. I think that's the problem. Putting yourself in position full stop. I don't, I'd, I'm massively on the fence with Lee. It's, it's very hard for me not to, Look at him similarly to my dad because you know it's oh his legs are going, he's, he does this, he dives into challenges. Then players are f- to do that role, so it's it's hard for me not to to feel a bit for Lee. I uh, think it's hard for I, Sunderland fans not to feel for Lee, yeah, and, yeah. and we have felt for him in the past, I would say. But I would probably do agree that he probably does need to come out of it for a couple of weeks for mm. for Lee's sake and for Sunderland's sake. Because I think it could be one of those ones where he come back in he, the way he's playing, he probably gets sent off again. You know, take him out and then let Chris manage him. 
on a one to one level yeah. and see where we go. And then then we're going to see if can Lee, if Lee can do it for us the rest I've, of the season. I've, I've just got a feeling that second yellow was born of frustration of how bad he's mm-hmm. playing. Maybe you know you, what things go badly for you when when your confidence is low and you know you. It, it, I just sense a bit of frustration with that one. It, it, poor touch got away from him. He dove in to win it. Yeah, obviously, he didn't mean to get sent off. He's not a complete idiot, but I just no. think I just think that his experience should rule there, and he should he should know not to be as, so stupid. How many times last season in the Premier League did we see him get booked and then be able to manage his game? brilliantly afterwards yeah, yeah. like be able to go right I've been booked but I'm not going to dive in I'm just going <coughs> to sit a little bit deeper standoff and like Catmull's game was actually better once he'd been booked because yeah, he used to yeah. stop, used to stop charging around bit. this season I mean he's neither of those he's, he's you know, the pressing midfielder we used to love is gone for me I don't know I just don't think he's got the legs to do it but I think I just think even when he's sitting deep he's very ineffective now he, his passing isn't great and you know he's not he's not winning us he's not ball. imposing like he used to no, I mean no. I watched him a couple of years ago against Chelsea and I thought Christ mm. who, who's this player you know he had, he, had, he had everything that game and he's not imposing himself on games like he used to you know there's, there's games where he's he's grabbed the game by the scruff of the neck and we've got a point out of it or we've, might, we've done something because of him and I'm not seeing that from at the moment in time I think yeah. it must be frustrating for him that he knows he used to be able to do that and his body's letting him down at the moment I think that might be That's that might be half of the uh, half of the problem I guess for me Lee Catamore's best period of his career has been under Gus Poyet when we were under Gus Poyet and Poyet completely changed his game and developed his game he was protected in a system that helped him that benefited all of his strengths he was he was playing alongside either Larson called back a key in the middle mm. who would do the running for him a little bit like Honeyman Gibson and Gooch right now and he was, he was absolutely brilliant for that six months to a year at least by, by the time he developed and I think it's it's just taken its toll on him now like he's he's, he's passed it since then he, he can't play at that level anymore and it's possibly just all the injections that he's had over the time oh, like he's, he's made his career he made his debut as the Borough's youngest ever captain over over a decade ago and because of all this injections all the constant injuries the leg injuries all the, all the playing week in week out and the short breaks in the summer no winter break at all I think it's just a victim of a long English game I think you can guarantee Lee being the type of player he is as well he, he'll have played through niggles and stuff like yeah, that yeah Definitely. I'd expect so but then it's a, it's a good point you just made there then what I would say to Lee is what can you do now to adjust your game for you to still be effective how Clever. intelligent are you now yeah. just to show me what you can do in games if you can't chase it all the time can you dictate to another player to, can you cover we've got to look at him now and think right, what else can you do f- for us You know, yeah. and what can you bring mentally for us here because yeah. Yes, you might not be able to dive in every challenge, but you can move your body in different areas where you make he, he it harder to play through. He needs to kind of become like the John O'Shea of the midfield in a way. It, yeah. it, it needs, it needs not, not grow up, shall I say, but he needs to probably think a little bit older, shall I say. You know, mm. I can't afford yeah. to do this, so what, what's my next step? Almost like a chess player. He, he yeah. shouldn't be thinking what's happening right in front of me now. What do I need to do for the second move? Because I can't afford to dive in here. That's exactly. I mean, Andrea Perlo never had any legs. He played week in, week out for decades. He's... The sort of player who just used his mind. He was ten steps ahead of where the opponent was doing. Yeah, Scholes, these sort of players like that. And Catmull just needs to develop his game again. Just change it. He's, and we need to see if he's got that intelligence and got that composure, or if his game the whole time was based on his ability to pressure, his ability to dictate, his ability to just basically keep the side going. Like he's still got that leadership. Yeah, he's, you can still see that like, the way he talks to the players, the way the players listen to him, the, play, the players like react to his decisions. He, like, off the ball, he's he's still a leader in the team, and he's a massive figure in the dressing room. But when he's on the ball, he's just letting himself down, and he just needs to definitely change his game. Like maybe like, a little bit of a strange comparison might be Dwight York. Dwight York as a, yeah. as a player was a that's not bad. We're all bus- now ahead yeah. in the studio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a bustling striker who just very dynamic, closing down everything off the ball, based it on pace. And by the time he was at Sunderland after a year at Sydney. He's almost just like a laid back, very laid back defence midfielder who would just be three or four steps ahead of everybody else and just play it easy. He was yeah. great in that two one against the match. Brilliant, yeah. I wrote I wrote something on the site today about this actually, and I said it feels like Catmull's at a bit of a crossroads really. Now now he's 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 out of the team now next week. Obviously, um, he, he has to reflect on what what's happened and be like, where do I go from here? You yeah. know, do I do, do I really knuckle down and 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 try and adapt my game because obviously. Um, the sending off if it proves anything it proves that Lee Catamore's you know lost a step maybe he needs to develop his role into something else but I mean it's either that or he, or he you know his future lies as well that's something I think and I don't think anybody wants to see that truly mm. deep down I think I think if we could get you know something out of a tune out of Lee Catamore between now and the end of the season where he's effective in that team then we all benefit from it but the problem is is we can't accommodate players it's like what we were saying before with Lyndon Gooch um, he probably doesn't have half the ability that Lee Catamore does, but what he does have is, uh, you know, a youth 
hung on his yeah. side, yeah. Yeah. and you know, can we really afford to keep giving chances to a player like Catwell, who by all means is very well liked, you know, great leader in the dressing room? Obviously, he's been here a long time. You'd like think he knows what Sunderland's about. He's probably not that but, far for testimonial. You know, well, you know we're, we're, we're talking about a player who's been here a very long time, but can we afford to hang around and? And keep affording him chances when he keeps making mistakes. I don't think we can in our in our position. Mm. I think Coleman. I think Coleman. You know, although he he spoke after the game about how he sympathised with Catamol and you know spoke about how he'll bounce back. I think he's got a lot of time for Catamol. Probably through speaking to your dad. Very you know. I would, ex- I would expect yeah. so. Yeah, but then I think it's probably another bit of man management from Chris again, though, isn't it? He, what, yeah. what, what he says in front of the, the radio and the presenters. Maybe is it's different. what he's thinking about buying uh-huh. the scenes. And I, I don't mind that. You know. Mm. And how Chris judges Lee at the next week, two or three weeks, is you're going to really see. If he if he's straight back on the side, then obviously Chris backs one hundred and ten percent. If he's not, or he's in the round, then we're going to see where Lee's mm. where he's going to play the next couple of months. He, he wasn't hung out to dry afterwards. The Coleman's uh, comments. No. He, he defended no. him really, didn't he? I think that's the right thing to do. That's just Coleman's managerial style. Mm. He's, uh, he's he, if any if any if Catmull's going to change his game like that, I think Coleman's the right manager for it. Yeah. Coleman's not the sort of manager who's going to go in and lambast the player for it. You'll sit him down one to one and just talk to him. Man, he's he's perfect man management wise, and Catmull needs that now more than anything. I think Catmull will respond to that type of direct. Yeah, I do as well. I think yeah, you know we definitely. mentioned Chris having a presence. He's not mm. someone who's going to come in and shout and scream and yeah. shout the odds. I think you're going to listen to him because he's going to go onto your level. Mm. There's, there's, there's different kinds of presences and I think that's where Chris is going to sh- surely bring his, his, his strengths he's, he's, he's done definitely got something grace and lacked mm-hmm. that's for sure I mean Kirk Coleman's done this before with Wales I mean, Joe Ledley was a very attacking a very dynamic midfielder at Celtic and then at Wales he was struggling a little bit with his game and he, I don't know if it was Coleman or if it was Ledley but he, he, dev- he changed his game he's a much more deep line much more composed midfielder mm. and he's doing very well for Derby right now to sign a new contract and Coleman's done that with Ledley and he, it was in the international games that he could see the difference it's a, it's a bit different but look at Ramsey as well like Coleman completely unleashed Aaron Ramsey told him to go play his game took the captaincy off him told him he didn't need it Yeah. told him just just you go and play you be that man off the off the front guy and go for it see I used to worry that that was the, with the problem with Lee a little bit the responsibility was a little bit not too much from over there mm. you just didn't need it you know just go and do your you, you can impose yourself on the game without having to worry about the other ten around you it's, in, it's yeah. interesting you say that because you were, you were talking before about how he was best under Gus Poirier. Yeah. Well, you think what happened not long before Poirier arrived, he had the captain taken away uh, from him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then obviously by the time Poirier arrived, clean slate, but O'Shea was still the captain. Um, and probably the best form that Catamo was shown was you when can, he wasn't. You can captain. be a captain without wearing the armband, you, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's maybe that's maybe that's what Lee needs. I mean, I know my father went to Burnley. He wasn't a the captain there, mm. but it'd, be, it'd have been no different than what he was at Sunderland. Yeah. Perhaps that's what. In the long game, that's what Lee needs. Just concentrate on yourself, Lee. You do your role, Lee. Then, in time, you can start bringing other people into it. I mean, I just feel a little bit for Lee. I'm, I'm not going to write him off just yet, but I think we are getting quite close to the last chance of him, shall I say? Yeah. I think that's why so many Sunderland fans are kind of like it, it's, it's not really angry. It's kind of, it's kind of upset about what's happened with Catamol because like every just about most Sunderland fans love Catamol. He's at times he's been the heart and soul of the team over the last couple, like last five years at least. And it's just the drop in performance is so vast and it's so obvious that he just needs a little bit of help and he needs a little bit of time off to be able to develop, be able to change. And it's almost like the synonymous of our decline as a club, isn't it? Watching yeah. him drop yeah. is how, how far we've dropped as a club as well. And I think that's what probably hurts me a little bit as well. <laughs> first first game of the season when we played Derby, he was man the match. He was I, was yeah, I, I thought yeah. he was good there. I thought you know, he was very and that, good. That's after a pre-season or summer break. I mean, we're not talking about that long ago. It was only August. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought we were going to walk the division, me, you know, after that game. <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> just, that was my little boy's first game as well, and yeah. uh, oh. it was his last. Like, he didn't enjoy it at all. <laughs> don't blame him. It, it, it wasn't the most exciting game. No, but don't blame him either. No, I thought we were gonna we were gonna build into the championship of it, yeah. you know. But anyway, on to the Fulham game. Um, mm. Got a question from Cameron Johnson. Do you think we can build onto that strong result we just got at Wolves next week when we will play Fulham? What are your thoughts? Yeah, what? definitely. Like the best thing about the game at the weekend was the identity. We're a team with identity right now. We've got a formation set in stone. We've got a way of playing set in stone. And the players played how you want to see a Southern player play in a shirt. They worked for everything together. And we can build that going forwards. And the most interesting thing actually is not the Wolves game, but it's the under-23s game today. The under-23s were set up in exactly the same formation. I know what's in that, the yeah. three, yeah. three, 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 five, whatever it is. Three, five, one. Uh, three, four, three formation. It was, and that's promising for the future because it looks like, for once, we're going to have, hopefully... 
this formation, a set way of playing throughout from academy, from the senior team all the way down to academy level. Yeah. And that makes it a lot easier for these players to come in, these players who are going to be given chances in the future. All too long in the past, we've been playing completely different styles of football at academy. And then they get in the first team and they don't really know what they're doing. Like, obviously, they're playing with new players, but if they're playing in a system that's set up club-wide, which most successful clubs do, it'll, it'll be a lot easier for the players to adapt just just to hog on to his time um, at Wales again, the bench, when, when players would get injured at the Euros and stuff, everybody was interchangeable, everybody mm-hmm. knew the system. Volks would come on for Carnu or vice versa. I mean, Wales lost, I think they the played the opening game without Hennessy. They had to, they had to they get the substitute goalkeeper in because he got an injury. Completely interchangeable, knew, knew what he was doing, knew who he was playing out to. And I think that's promising, as you say, with the under-23s to have, to have that kind of universal format coming through. It was it was what we were all hoping would happen eventually. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is that Coleman would settle on something which which he thought would um, be able to build on that system? I mean, I looked before the game. Uh, the last team to beat Wolves was uh, QPR, who went man for man. They went five at the back. They lost earlier in the season, I think. It might have been to Fulham. Sheffield United. Sheffield United. Sorry, yeah. That's it. And mm-hmm. matching systems. So you know that'll have been in the back of his mind, thinking, well, if we're going to stand any chance here, we need to try and play that five yeah. the same way they do. Uh, it worked clearly, you know. Um, but I think I think eventually we would have come to this anyways because yeah. that's that's the system which got him so much um, praise, I guess, as Wales manager. Being able, you know, a limited squad of players, and granted he had Gareth Bale and Aaron Ramsey, but he still had, like you say, Vokes, Carnu, Simon and, Church. Yeah, <laughs> play, very limited players, but obviously very passionate about what they do and mm. playing for their country is is the highest honour they'll ever receive. So. Being able to find a system which got the best out of those players, I mean, great management, but we've got to look at what we've got, and we've got something like 15 fit players at the minute. That's what's positive yeah. for me, is we're getting the, the formation the identity right. You can only be positive when we get, he brings in the players he wants to bring in in those positions as well. Because yeah. yeah. you, can, you can know what he's asking of them, he, yeah, they already know definitely. what their role is. So that's a big plus for it's me. It's a shame that Johnny Williams isn't fit. I honestly think. Uh, it would be I crucial, think, I, I think, you know. I mean, yeah. hopefully when he gets himself back fit, he can stay fit, because, you know, I can, I can just. See that being a match made in heaven. Well, Welsh like, fans call him Johnny Esther. For yeah, a reason, you know. Every every fan of every club he's ever played for has got loads of time for Johnny Williams, and then he just can't get a run of games, can he? No, no it's unfortunate. Like I mean, it really is. He, lo- he was out the, out the team of the migraine at one point. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's just, but you've got to think maybe that with Coleman here, you can. I mean, I think Adam Matthews has been. Nah, he's been. Very, he's, he's been, good, been really he? good since Coleman coming. He's one player who's went under the radar a bit. I wouldn't say outstanding, but I just think you've got to think where he's come from. I consider it against Bolton when he was being applauded <laughs> for making a. Making a, a pass yeah. to a teammate, uh, yeah, point. which w- w- wasn't nice to say we condemned it, but it shows mm. how far it's come. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I'm not big on the ironic cheers and things like that. It's, uh, but it does show how far he's come. I mean, he, like, even against a Borough, I don't think he did that bad. You know, go back to the Borough game, I don't think he did that bad. Mm. I think he did well. Yeah, I'd, if, right? I'm, if I'm going to say at the pay him and Billy Jones in this division, I think I'll probably air towards. He looks like a confident player, doesn't he? He does. Uh-huh. He can get forward, which is the main, which is quite important these days, you know. But Billy Jones, I don't think is very effective either defensively or offensively. <laughs> yeah, Matthews. Matthews, <laughs> Matthews, yeah. Matthews obviously has, he has good and bad days like any player at this level. But I think, um, I think, I think under the right manager and the right system, you will see the best from him. You know, you're looking at you're looking at, at going back to the Wales the Wales team that Coleman had. Um, one of his longest serving players was Chris Gunn a man who I mean I spoke to a Reading yeah, I... fan before the game the other week for our you know Thursday night podcast and uh, he wasn't particularly I mean Gunn has been there years and he was like well yeah, he's a very average player I mean mm. not a lot of Reading fans have got much good yeah. to say about Chris Gunn but there's a player who in Coleman's Wales team was a ever beater. present yeah. yeah you know and it just shows you what he can do with limited players and I think probably the best thing for Matthew's career was his his old Wales manager walking through the door yeah know? definitely right Luke can I get a, a score prediction for the Fulham game uh, well, he's not going to want to then go and get beat, is he? No. Is he? Um, I think we might. We'll score, but whether we. Well, I'm going to go with a one or draw, to be honest with you. I can't see us taking three points, but I can't see us getting beat either. I'm, I'm the same as you. I think I'm going to go nil nil, though. I can't see us scoring, but I reckon we'll, I reckon we'll keep them out. James, how do you see it? It's quite difficult. Fulham, on paper, have got a very strong team. Like, very fast, very pacey. It, it, it's a team that should, in the past, have hit us quite hard like we're not a team that defends well against pace or counter attacks and that's generally how Fulham play they play on the front foot but saying that I've got some, I got a lot of confidence from the performance at the weekend getting the clean sheet in the matter that we did against what is rightfully probably Premier League quality players especially the front three and Ruben Neves in the right, middle ch- Champions League pedigree though yeah like the, they are very very high standard of player going down to 10 men like that we've got a good mentality we've got a bit of confidence going into the game and 
the Red Match, I think the loss, although it's bad as it was, long term, probably is helping us. It's allowed Coleman to get his vision and his system in earlier. Mm. He's implemented it as early as possible now, and we can move on and build on that. So I think if we play the same style of football in the same manner, in the, the same dedication, playing for the shirt the way they did, I think we could go out there and get a win. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's quite a low score in 1 0, and I'd mm. be delighted with that. Gaff, yeah, how do you yeah, see? Um, I agree with that. I think, I think the one thing we've got to remember is that uh, when we were sat in the studio after the Burton game, <laughs> flying highs of kite, we were, we were very yeah, pleased. But, yeah. but, but the one thing that you know you can't ignore is that it's at home. <laughs> uh, play, playing at the stadium, alike, that was my know. point. Yeah, I, there's, there's that voodoo or hoodoo around playing at home. Maybe it, we need some voodoo to get rid. Yeah, of. that's probably, that's probably <laughs> what it is. That's, that's probably what it is. I just don't. I feel for the fans. It's not easy. It's not easy for the players. No, but you know the fans have come every week, and I I don't know what you can say to the players. You know, it's not you're playing a game. We all want to. We'd all love to play ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Just imagine we aren't at home. Is it yeah. that hard? Is it that hard really? Would, if 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 he goes with pretty much the same team he went with at the weekend, and in a similar fashion, because I think to be honest, I think setting up against Fulham is going to be pretty similar to the way we did against Wolves. Like you're talking about, they've got a lot of pace out wide. Um, if we're set up in the same way, and the, and the fans see the same sort of desire. To win the ball back and, and defend, then I, I don't think that one nil's beyond the realms of possibility. I yeah. Think I'd, 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 but will they get frustrated yeah. with it though? Because we're not maybe, be entirely yeah. I mean, They did against Redden, didn't they? Yeah. You know? yeah. Mm. It was... That's that's my only worry. I mean, I can absolutely understand the frustrations. Um, it's just there's that, there's that fine line, isn't there? Yeah. Mm. yeah. There is that fine line. That is helped by playing the system that we played with Honeyman and Gucci, the side off Graben, because they were a little bit more advanced. Mm. So Graben doesn't work off the ball. Doesn't really work on the ball. Like Gravin just doesn't work at all like that. He's just a good finisher. And, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. I, I hasten yeah. to add. You, you you need goals to win games. You do. Yeah. But with Gooch and Honeyman, they pressed high against Wolves. Mm. Like Sidon was sat, well, did sat quite deep, but they pressed off the ball a lot, and they've done a lot of Gravin's work for him. So I don't. Hopefully, with those two in the team like that, we'll have them pressing in the in the final third, and we won't be sitting as deep against Fulham as well against Redden, especially uh, against Wolves. Sorry, especially at home. But one. So I think they could do the running for Gravin. So hopefully that'll ease the crowd's nerves a little bit. Mm. But I think we do need to take one thing out of the Redden game, and that's the mentality in the first half. Yeah, definitely. Coleman said in his pre-match press, press conference that he doesn't want us going out all out for 20 minutes, having most of the game and then conceding again early like, against the run of play and just being completely deflated. The crowd off with the crowd not on the side anymore. Players need to be calmer like they did against the Redden start. Mm. They played very, I think, played very well in the first half, and all we needed was that goal, that little bit of luck to get the goal, a little bit, probably a bit more dynamic play to get that. And if we can start in a similar manner with the first 20, 25 minutes, just playing it calm, just keeping composed against what is a talented Wolf, uh, Fulham team. You can't doubt that. They may not be successful, but they've got some talented players. And then hopefully that we don't have our game plan absolutely trashed at the very end of the first half like it was in the Redden game because that destroyed yeah. the game from there. So we've got Luke with a 1-1, did you say? I'm with 1-1. I'm going 0-0. James is going... 1-0. And you're going, Gav? 1-0, son. So that means we'll definitely lose. because right, we'll then. 3-0 Fulham, then, isn't it? That? Otherwise. Right, we'll, we'll move on to a, a few more general questions for Luke. Um... Mm. There's a well. There was a, a bit of an issue on on Twitter amongst uh, Sunderland fans the other day um, with the way that the club utilises your father um, in terms of I think what's this? Gav, you know better than me. These these drink click machines collect, or something. This drink machine. Click and uh, collect kiosks. pints. I don't understand why I need to click and collect pints. Like just wait at the bar like everybody else. But yeah, yeah big, not... big Kev's supposed to be teaching fans how to do it. Yeah, they, it's a load of bollocks. It really is. I cannot stand. Don't get me wrong, he's, he's a fucking idiot for agreeing to doing this. He is, I don't care what anyone says, and I'll tell him to his face. But the trouble is, I find it demeaning. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's it's very easy for me to sit here and say, I find it demeaning of him. I'm sure there's other people that can show someone how to pour a fucking pint. You know, you don't need to ask me to do that. Yes, I, I, I agree with the, you know, it's a publicity, the, the keeping in touch with the fans. There's a million and one people can teach me how to pour a pint. Mm. You don't have to use my father. The, the bloke does enough for the club. Yeah. He'll, as I said, he'll clean the change rooms for you, but don't lure, lure him enough to teach you how to, to pour a fucking pint. And, and you say he does enough for the club, but he, he, he does enough for the area and the people that support the club as well. I mentioned on the podcast before, he came in and, and did an interview with me after he had a cancel one, the day after Grayson had been sacked and he had better things to do. Yeah, yeah John, and John it is, he loves doing them, he loves being involved with the club, he loves helping in any way he can. Each time, do, it, I always think they're taking advantage of him, and when they take yeah. advantage of him, it knocks it knocks a bit of shine off of what he's done. I think you know this is a man who's bled, poured out, mm. and I'm 
I, I'm, I'm blowing smoke up his ass a little bit here. I'm his worst critic as well, and me and him clash heads on a lot of things. But I will defend him if I think he's right. And when you start using someone or, or overexposing them, sometimes the shine comes off. Yeah. And, and I think that's where I'm probably getting quite defensive over him because of it. I mean, don't get me wrong. He, he does these, you know, he used to do the things there, the fans for him before the games. I wasn't massively smitten on him doing those, but he used to enjoy it because he used to love speaking to people. Yeah. So that's fine. So be it, you know, you're ambassador, you have to do those roles. But to, to show points, how poor, uh, poor a pint, I'm sorry, I don't agree with it. For me, he, he's a coach, not a, not a yeah. pint pourer. Like yeah. That. I mean, for some reason, he's not coaching anymore. Someone in that club has made a decision that Kevin Ball's not a coach anymore. Why? I don't know. He, he must have he's obviously pissed off the wrong person or someone's got a different vision for him now but this man is doing a job probably I would say 10 years too early mm. you know he's he's had his, he's had his knee done the broken now walk perfectly fine was, a couple of years ago he couldn't he looked ridiculous when he's walking around but the man is a footballing man and he's not being he's not being utilised shall I say um, and there's me saying oh I wish you would do a, go, go off and do other things but the club have got him by the balls he loves it yeah. and yeah, that's, that's where true. And that's what pisses me off like, because with with Quinn, people say now Quinn he's to like he, well now Quinn himself said that Sunderland got under his skin. With Borley, it's not just that Borley is Sunderland and Sunderland yeah. is Borley. Like he loves the club and we all love Borley as well. Like he is a hero to them, <laughs> so many of our, like fans. And it seems like whenever it's like the club have got this opinion where it's like oh the times are bad, the fans are angry. We'll wheel Borley we'll out, wheel him out uh-huh. like, every single like time. It's prop. just disrespectful. Like that, uh, that when they did the um, I think it was the Heaven Branch. Yeah. Even when you know there was Martin being there and uh, was Grayson oh, there as well. Yeah. I think. You and then and then the compliment that, that they what? had Kevin Ball. There why, why does he need? Why does he need to be there? A, a picture painted a, a thousand. Uh-huh. as well if you don't mind me saying. Yeah. Why does he? Why does my father need to be there? You've got Bain there. You've got Grayson, there, and who's I think was a. Duncan Watmore was there. Duncan Watmore, yeah. who's a very well spoken, yeah. intelligent chap. There's no need to wheel out Can't Big Kev. There really isn't. Because you're only there to placate the fans in case someone's having a go. That's it, yeah, yeah. And our fans aren't that thick, they're starting to click on a little bit. If they truly respected him, I think he would have been given a role within the upper echelons of the coaching staff a long time ago. And it's well, it, he should have been given that person. And, and let's, let's not underestimate what, what the bloke did for the club and the tradition, the proud tradition he carries on with like a hard fighting, battling man who can play in the midfield. He took over from Gary Bennett and there was Bobby Kerr before him there's been Cat them all after him we've always had that tradition at the club yeah. it's part of the identity he is a massive part of Sunderland's identity yeah. and to see him not utilised in the correct way it, it, it infuriates me to be honest that's having met I'm, the man and how, how nice he is as well that's what I think that's what frustrates me most and when I, I speak to him and we speak a lot and we, we argue a lot particularly when it comes to Sunderland Football Club because he'll he'll say Sunderland's the, the world's best of everything and sometimes I say no, it fucking isn't. <laughs> Do you know what it is? It's, no, it's not. You know, you'll say, "Oh, but we scored three goals today. We drew three all at home to Bolton, Dad." You know, be realistic. But no, no, we did this. No, Dad, we drew. We conceded three at home to Bolton. So it's it's hard watching him look at the Sunderland through those eyes. And sometimes I just want to say, "Dad, just leave for a bit. Just go and do your thing for a little bit." But but for some reason he can't. And as a son, that that does become a little bit frustrating. Um, but. You know, that's his choice. It's his life to lead. But uh, well, we, we asked him about that when we did an interview with him for up reports. We asked him your, your question. You yeah, I know. Yeah, him. I was in. I was on holiday in uh, in Crete as well, and I got a uh, a nice phone call, oh, and I was yeah. sat around the beach. Uh, yeah. yeah. And he, he, he turned around. He said he'd thought about it, and he he turned around and said nobody ever considers is that I just love it. That that was his response. Why haven't I moved on? Because I just love it here. Yeah, I I do get that, and. When we, again, this is an argument we have all the time. You say, why should I have to go elsewhere to prove myself? Why should I have to move two, three hundred miles away? Because if it gets, he's got a family up here. He's got a grandson up here now. Mm. Um, for a long period of time, including when Decanio was here, when Poya was here, he was the most qualified at the club. I think he probably still is one of the most highly qualified at the club. Sometimes, and I, I use this quite often on Twitter. Uh, that it's always the loyal dog that gets put down in the end. Yeah. You know, the one that's always there for you. It's, it's always in the background. Always do you run around. You always want the newer dog, the brand newer dog. You know, the new toy at Christmas. You know, the train set you've played with since you were five. Mm. That gets put away because uh, there's a newer train set out. And I think he's been the victim of that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I find frustrating as a, as a son. You know, don't get me wrong. They say, oh, you should have got the manager's job. Yes, I know. I can see, I can see both sides of it. Yes, perhaps you should have done before Poye. But no, he didn't. That's his life. You know, it's one of those things. Is it a David De Gea save away from it, really? Uh, he's, uh, he was there. But he, Yanis, I won it. Yeah. The, the only one game he played in his whole career. Yeah, well, he's, he's done quite well. He scores two goals. Yeah, half of his career goals him. at the stadium. Like yeah, that. but um, it's at least he can say as a man he has managed the club. And I think that's what 
he wanted but I think he probably wanted a bit of a longer establish should I say <laughs> should I say like what happened to the dad with the whole caretaker role when Stockdale was giving it ahead of him just discussing like the whole new dog old dog like uh, now I don't agree with Robbie getting it either I don't particularly want to put my dad's name to this team at the moment in time because I think it wouldn't represent him as a person but I think for continuity it had to be Robbie what probably annoyed me a little bit was it was Robbie and Billy McKinley yeah mm. who jumped, yeah. Who jumped who the ship who the fuck's Billy McKinley for a start he comes in for a couple of weeks and now he's your first team uh, caretaker coach yeah um, it's, it's hard for Robbie because he's been the first team coach it's nice to be the first team coach because you don't make big decisions <laughs> everyone's me aren't you? you're everyone's yeah. friend you're not telling someone you're not playing this week so he's had to learn to, to do that and I think I watched the Borough game and I was thinking I watched our bench thinking this is now a derby game we're away at their ground is there anything on our bench that's thought oh there's a bit of presence there and there wasn't for me yeah. and I think that's probably the only issue I had with Robbie doing that job in terms of me dad doing it he's been out of you, you could argue he's been out of the the football inside for a long time now my dad watches every, every home game every away game and he fries abroad to scout players midweek my dad probably watches more games than other, other coaches do full stop so you know whilst he's not coaching studs on the ground he's watching three games a week mm. didn't, so what's, what he, we, me and my father always do this with, with each other I'll pick one team one half he picks another comes a half time what's our half time team talks so he's doing that three times a week so really he's not out of football is he because he's watching football constantly so it's I, I get the argument he's been out of football for too long let someone else have a go but you know the, the man's won the league twice um, knows the club inside out but you know Martin, Martin Bain had a different decision to make didn't he uh, it's it's an interesting one for me I, I, I'm much the same as you I didn't want to see his legacy tarnished when the job came up recently because mm-hmm. I, I just thought I don't think there's anything anybody can do what, what I do think needs to be happening is that he needed to be part of the process in terms of finding a new manager Yeah. or he needs to be a kind of I don't know what the, all sorts of terms flying around these days director of football like a chief executive whatever you know somebody like we've had them all over the years like Defante and Congerton he, he needs to be in that group of people at the club for me I think the trouble with Sunderland Football Club and this has been to our detriment is we've got a uh, what was known as a business board we haven't really got a footballing board yeah, definitely. Um, and that's probably where you, if you're going to pigeonhole my father into a role at the club now, it would be on some sort of footballing board. Yeah, um, so. It's it's not, it's no coincidence. That obviously, my dad knows Chris, and Chris got the job. I mean, I'm not going to put two and two together. I'm sure you can add things up yourselves. Well, he, he said as much himself, didn't he? So you know, that's so he obviously has got an influence there. It's not to any degree people think it is. Um, I, I need to have an argument with one bloke. Tell your tell your father he needs to do this and this and that. He's just an ambassador for the club. You know, he goes and shakes hands. I, w- I want him to have more of a role, but unfortunately, he doesn't. Mm. So there's, a, there's, only, there's only so much my father can do. And until Mr. Bain makes a decision otherwise, that's all my father's ever going to be at Sunderland Football Club. I think this whole business board idea, idea is why like th- th- this, they're having this conversation. If I think there's just a flagrant disregard of the talents and knowledge that your father has. Mm. Yeah, completely. And just, it, it just seems like from a footballing level, they just don't understand the influence and he has on the players and the club and the fans and everything I, it's what it is I think it goes back to the, the loyalty and the you can be too loyal um, don't get me wrong me and my dad argue nine, nine times out of ten because I, I think the bloke's a bit of an arsehole at times and he thinks he, he, and he thinks <laughs> and he thinks the same of me I'm absolutely sure of it you could say that I never went to him yeah but then <laughs> but what I can never question him of is, is his loyalty to some of the book club and that's that's yeah. been to our family's detriment at times as well you know there's times where he's had to leave and he's done this for some football club oh I've got to go to a, a heaven branch meeting you're supposed to take my little boy out for the night but no he's got to do a heaven branch meeting for no reason do you know and that's that's what pisses me off as a as a son him going to a heaven branch meeting when there's no need for him to be there you know why why aren't you at home with me and my little boy playing snooker like we're supposed to do on a Tuesday yeah. night or on a Thursday night that's where they start taking advantages and that's where I start biting back a little bit and when I start seeing pouring pints I think right that's a I'm saying my little piece, but it's not often I can say my piece about uh, him ringing me up 30 seconds later. And yeah, you, may, you may get a phone call off the back of this. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get a phone call off the back of this. <laughs> I know I am. Yeah. It's hey, a good, did, it's a, did you tell him you were coming on? Or? I told him about five minutes before I left. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> and the phone's off as well. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not daft. I've played Safe. this game before. Yeah, I know uh, he's like. I know he's like. Well, if, if you're listening, uh, Kev, it's, uh, <laughs> we, we apologise on behalf of you, son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you when I get home. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Right, lads, I think that's a wrap, isn't it? Hi. Thank you very much. Yeah, cheers for having me, James. Cheers for coming. Laugh, yeah. Appreciate it. I've been um, James Copley, your host. You've been joined by Gav, another James, and of yes. course Luke Bolt. We're on iTunes, Acast, and YouTube, Twitter as well, Facebook, and Instagram now. We got loads of followers what? off the back last week. I think we got at least fifty. Like, did we? There we go. Uh, we should have a Snapchat as well. I don't know why, but I just feel like we should have a Snapchat. No, there you go. No, follow know. the club Snapchat. <laughs> like I've not got enough to do. <laughs> just, just take photos of Lewis grabbing and just put yes grabs. Well, he's the least mobile, so well, uh-huh. that's a little dig. That wasn't it. <laughs> 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 right, we'll end it there. Thank you for listening. Cheers. <laughs>